I want to give you a little bit of it today. And what I want to do, actually, I'm going to take you, and we're not going to be in the book of Acts, but I'm going to take you to the end of the book of Acts, the very last chapter, chapter 28, as Paul is in Rome. And uh, it's somewhere between 61 and 63 that he's going to write, I'm going to call a dangerous letter for us to learn from. It was one of many different letters that he wrote when he was under house arrest in Rome. And this is nearing, going towards the end where if you don't know the end of uh, the Apostle Paul's life, he was beheaded. And the only reason he was beheaded is because as a Roman, they were going to treat you with a little bit of uh, grace. They were going to give you a little bit of dignity and they're going to they're take your head off. That's how they're going to end your life. Paul was, uh, Peter was crucified upside down. Many of them were, literally uh, one of them uh, was a noose around their neck, attached to horses, drugged through the streets until they died. They were stabbed to death. They were burned alive. I mean, you, you name it, the apostles went through it. And it's really just challenged my life in such a way to see, even last night I had a, a run-in. That's another story. I had a run-in with a demon last night. If you want to find me later, I'll tell you about it crazy experience. Never had one like this. I've cast demons out before, but I've never had an experience like this before. And the first thought that went through my mind, because I was getting very intimidated in this moment, as I went, what would Paul do? Would he let this demon run wild in this city, or would he deal with it? I've been getting this dangerous spirit in me, and so what I want us to do, I'm going to probably take maybe from a leadership kind of perspective, how we can grow in leadership, servanthood, and stuff. But I want to dive into uh, the book of Philemon. It's a one chapter, quick read. I'm going to read the whole thing for you. Paul would have written this in Acts 28, if you look at the timeline. He's in Rome under house arrest between 61 and 63 AD, somewhere in there when he wrote it, because he's there for two years. And uh, I want to talk about why he wrote it and what he wrote. So you can follow with me here. Philemon chapter 1, because there's only one of them. Uh, let's look at verse 1. We're going to read all 25 verses. Paul a prisoner, I just explained why, like literally not just, not just metaphorically, he's actually a prisoner here of Christ Jesus, and Timothy, our brother. So we set it up right away that this is co-authored by Paul and Timothy together. They're bringing their thoughts here. And who are they right into? To Philemon, our dear friend and fellow worker. Also to Aphia, our sister, and Archippus, our fellow soldier. And to the church that meets in your home, grace and peace to you from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. I always thank my God as I remember you in my prayers. And that always just baffles my mind that he's in prison, yet he's thanking God and he's worrying about other people. Like I'm praying for them, not for myself. Because I hear about your love for all his holy people and your faith in the Lord Jesus. And I pray that your partnership with us in the faith may be effective in deepening your understanding of every good thing we share for the sake of Christ. Your love has given me great joy and encouragement because you, brother, remember he's writing to Philemon, have refreshed the hearts of the Lord's people. Therefore, although in Christ I could be bold and order you to do what you ought to do, yet I prefer to appeal to you on the basis of love. It is as none other than Paul, an old man. He's like, hey, I've lived a long life. I've fought the good fight. Remember he said, I've finished the race. I'm now in, in chains here for the Lord. I'm an old man and now also a prisoner of Christ Jesus that I appeal to you for my son Onesimus, who became my son while I was in chains. Formerly, okay, so I'm going to give you the topic a little bit here now we're leaning in that uh, you signed up for today for this breakout. Formerly, he was useless to you, but now he has become useful both to you and me. And, and I'm sending him, who is my very heart, back to you. And I would have liked to keep him with me so that he could take your place in helping me while I was in chains for the gospel. But I did not want to do anything without your consent. He's trying to be on good terms with Philemon. So that any favor you do would not seem forced, but would be voluntary. Perhaps the reason he was separated from you for a little while was that you might have him back forever. No longer as a slave, but better than a slave as a dear brother. He is very dear to me, but even dearer to you, both as a fellow man and as a brother in the Lord. So if you consider me a partner, welcome him as you would welcome me. And if he has done you any wrong or owes you anything, charge it to me. I, Paul, am writing this with my own hand. He, he would say that a lot when he would write. He's like, I want to make it clear. This ain't some like random Yahoo. It's I, Paul, that I'm writing you. I want you to know. And he'd have certain... Uh, kind of signature-esque pieces to his writings. He would start with like uh, right here at the beginning, greeting, uh, grace and peace. And so you would always know that Paul was the one 
here writing. So he says, I, Paul, am writing you with my own hand, and I pay, I pay it back to you, not to mention that you owe me your very self. I do wish, brother, that I may have some benefit from you in the Lord. Refresh my heart in Christ. Confident of your obedience, I write to you, knowing that you will do even more than I ask. And one thing more, prepare a guest room for me because I hope to be restored to you and answer to your prayers. So he's like, I'm hoping I won't be here anymore in Rome, but if you know the story, that's where it ended. But hope is still a powerful thing to hang on to with the Lord. He says, Epaphras, a fellow prisoner in Christ Jesus, sends you greetings. So do Mark, Aristarchus, Demas, and Luke, my fellow co-workers. The grace of the Lord Jesus be with you your spirit. Did everybody follow me with that? There's a lot there. We're going to unpack this thing, and we're just going to take this one chapter, this one letter. Amazing what Paul writes here. Rather than being so concerned with himself in chains, he's concerned with still how he can build the church even when he can't be with them. Isn't that what we're called to do? We're here to be a part of building the kingdom of God in his church. So let's lean in. Father, we love you. We want you to speak to us today, and we want to uh, not only just grow practically and have, you know, takeaways with you know, maybe leadership, maybe tools and gifts and things like that you can put inside of our, our bag, but Lord, more than that, we want to be transformed and changed by your word, and the only way that happens, we welcome you right now, Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit, we need you to speak to us, convict us, refine us, transform us so we can be more like Jesus. We love you. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. When I, uh, when I read this letter, there's a specific part in it. I haven't watched it in a while, but in college, I would watch The Office, if you know the show The Office. And there's this part I always think of where Dwight, in this episode, he shows up with these bagels. He goes to New York, and he gets, like, these famous bagels everyone loves. And he goes to everybody, and he's passing out these bagels, and they're like, oh, Dwight, you're being so kind. Like, how, how nice of you. And he's like, yeah, here's one. You owe me. And then he'll go over here to somebody else, and he'll give him a bagel, and say, oh, hey, have a great day. Here's a bagel. You owe me one. You know, and it's like, and he keeps going around, and he keeps acting as if he's telling everybody, it's just I want to be a nice guy. But really, the principle that he's trying to establish here is, I'm going to do something for you. Scratch your back. You're going to scratch my back. I get you this bagel that you love so much. You owe me one. Now, Paul probably isn't doing it with the same malicious intent as Dwight Schrute from the office. But if you read one of these verses, it really stood out to me how he approaches Philemon, and I think this is the power of good relationship with people, and this is the power of being the church, is we can come at it with a little bit of positive force and a way to say, listen, he, he wrote uh, later in, the, in that chapter, he goes, and I'm going to ask you to do something, but he goes, I actually hope that you'll do more than I even ask. That's essentially what Pastor Luke was even talking to us in this first session here at Surf Summit, is that there is the extension where God is reaching out saying, yeah, 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 I'm, I want to use you, but don't do it for pats on the back because I actually want to use you more than you even realize. I'm asking for more out of you as a servant of me. And so the way he approaches Philemon is very interesting. It's kind of like you, you, and, you owe me. Look at verse 18. And if he, meaning Onesimus, the guy that, so Paul is writing to Philemon, but he's talking about this guy Onesimus. He says, if he has done you any wrong or owes you anything, Charge it to me, Paul says. I'll take care of it. I, Paul, am writing this with my own hand, but look at this. I will pay it back. Not to mention, listen, he's like, I'll pay it back to you, but I just want to remind you, you owe me your very self. I love that. I love how Paul's just so straightforward. It's not just like, oh, yeah, I'll pay back. It's no, but I'll pay it back, but just remember, Philemon, I gave you that bagel. You owe me. And I love how Paul just, he's straightforward, he speaks to it. Now, there is so much history, so much going on. The plot and the people alone wrapped up in this little bit. I want to have us grasp it before we really unpack it because we can't really apply it to ourselves. What it's called uh, when you study scriptures, it's called uh, exegesis and hermeneutics. When you are looking at why he wrote it in that time and what it was happening and who it was for and how, what they were supposed to get out of it, it's called exegeting scripture, exegesis. But now... How do we apply it to us? It's called hermeneutics. Why does this letter, besides we go, well, we're Christians and it's the Bible. Now, that's, that's nice, but why does it mean anything for us today? 
right? That we've signed up for this breakout. We've signed up to grow and learn because it should mean something for us. So we got to first kind of exegete the scriptures, it's called. we got to look at who are these people, what's going on. So let's first start with who is Philemon? He's writing to this guy. Who is he? He's an early Christian in Asia Minor who's receiving this private letter from Paul. Now think about it. When Paul's in prison, he's writing a bunch of letters, and he writes it to churches, but he specifically spends it to sends it to a one dude, a personal guy, a private letter he sends it to. Philemon was really important because he was a leader of the church in Colossae. Uh, When we read the scriptures, we read the book of Colossians. That was written to the church in Colossae, and Philemon is one of the church leaders there. Now, it sounds like he's a bad guy because you hear the word slave, and obviously that has a super negative connotation, but it's a servant is the way that we'd actually translate it. It was a servant that worked for him. Philemon, quote-unquote, we'd say owns, meaning he worked for him as a slave. Onesimus worked for Philemon as his slave. Do you understand? So Philemon owned this guy, Onesimus, that we're talking about. So now the next question is, who is Onesimus? Now, when I was first trying to learn how to pronounce some of these names, you ever, you just like tongue-tied reading the Bible? It's where you just click play, let Bible man just tell you how how to read it, right? So it's pronounced Onesimus. So Onesimus, this slave, this servant, The entire plot of this is that he robbed Philemon and he ran away to Rome. Now, if you track the route from where he came from to Rome, he wasn't just trying to go the next city over to get away. He went 932 miles to get away from his owner. I mean, when you're talking taking boats and you're talking about trekking by feet, I mean, he was doing everything in his power, anything necessary to get away from his owner. This is what I love about this. As he's running away from Philemon, he runs into Paul. And I just love that thought for us because many times you look at Jonah or anything, when we're trying to run away, you're, what you're running from, you're always going to run into something else. If you run into Paul, you know what that means? You just ran into Jesus. So he's running from Philemon. He's not a follower of Jesus. He, he just stole from his master a ton of money is what it wrote stole all of his stuff and runs away 932 miles. But he runs into Paul, which means he runs into Jesus. You run into Jesus, everything changes, anybody in the room. You run into Jesus, everything changes. He runs into Paul. He hears the message of Jesus Christ. He's completely transformed, radical transformation. Now to this point, he, as Paul is writing, Paul now knows Onesimus because he ran into him there in Rome. And he's like, he's a different man. Philemon, let me tell you, I know he stole, I know he ran from you, but he's a completely different man. Why? Jesus changes everything. And now he wants to right all of his wrongs. I got thinking about this because I gave my life to Jesus at four. But I've been thinking lately, are there any people that I need to contact and tell what God's done in my life to right any wrongs, even from high school, even from college? Like, is there any people, I, I was actually convicted the other day during our revival week here, and the Lord said, why have you not called all your family members and t- told them that God healed you of cancer? All of your unsaved loved ones, why have you not taken the time to do that? Maybe some of you, it's like people knew you as one way. They knew you as a drunkard. They knew you as a thief. They knew you as a gossip. They knew you. Have you gone out of your way to go back and right the wrongs since Jesus That's what we're dealing with here in this letter. Onesimus, now a changed man, is he always going to be known and seen as who he was, or is he going to actually take a little bit of work to go backwards so he can actually go forwards? You know, I I found so many people, they found me on Facebook or whatever it is, and I think one of the greatest testimonies of my life is when people see who I am on social media, although it's the best, it matches who I said I was going to be when I was in high school. I just recently took uh, Zealand to preschool, and I ran into a guy I went to high school with, and he was like, Dave, Chris? And he looked at me, and he goes, man, you look just as young as you did in high school. And I was like, well, thanks for that, bro. But I'm like, look at the gray hair. I was like, no, I'm getting older, man. And he's like, man, I can't believe you look exactly the same. And I was like, man, keep talking, brother. Keep going. And, uh, and we got talking, and I felt bad because I'm like, I don't recognize you at all right now. <laughs> And it was amazing having this conversation because I said I was going to be a youth pastor when I was 16 years old in high school, and I was able to tell him, hey, I'm almost 36 now, 
20 years later, I'm doing exactly what I said I was going to do. I started thinking about, though, some of the life that I live in certain seasons of my life, although it was always my heart wanting Jesus, there was things that I did, decisions I made, things I said, the way I acted. The Lord's been convicting me. I need to write some of those things. Like, I literally need to reach out and be like, hey, this is random, but I just want to apologize. I know that that was just, that was, why did I say that? That was unnecessary. That was out of line. That's not who I am. God's changed me. I'm a different person. Or even my family members, listen, I'm healed. God's touched my physical body, and you need to know that because you are going to hell and you are dying without Jesus. And you need to know that Jesus, not, he doesn't just heal. He saves. He forgives. He can completely change your life. So I don't know how, like, maybe how that hits you, but this is Onesimus in this story. I love the Bible, Old Testament, New Testament. It's just full of so much drama. I'm going to tell you, this is, a, just, this is a drama llama story right here. So much drama in this. Because Paul is caught in the crossfire of two people. You understand this, right? He knows Philemon, and he's even a good friend and a, and a fellow co-worker there at the church in Colossae leading it. But then now he's with Onesimus in Rome. He knows Onesimus stole. And so he's caught in the crossfire of that friendship. Here's the dilemma. If he sends Onesimus back to Philemon, he's going to risk losing his ministry partner, Onesimus. Onesimus was actually used to deliver the letters to the church at Ephesus and the church at Colossae. So he's like a runner for him. He's like writing a letter and he send it and he's used. He's like, man, if, so if I send him back, I'm going to lose him. But I know if I don't send them back and I keep them here in Rome, then I'm going to risk offending Philemon because Onesimus stole money and ran away from his master. Let's take it even further. That's just the beginning of this conundrum. By Roman law, a person could not employ, he couldn't use in any way, a runaway slave. If Onesimus had run away, he can't be using him in any fashion according to Roman law. And Paul's a Roman citizen, so he knew this. But also, according to Levitical law, the first five books of the Bible are the, called the Pentateuch, right? Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus. It's called Le the Levitical law. According to that law, as a Jew, if, if someone ran away that was a Jew from their master and they came to you, you could not send them back to their master. You had to shelter them. So if he sends Onesimus back, he loses them. If he doesn't deal with this with Philemon, he's going to tick Philemon off. He can't use him according to Roman law, but he can't send him back according to Levitical law. What do you do? Because Levitical law, it says, I'll, I'll just make it real clear, in Deuteronomy 23, verse 15, it says that if a slave has taken refuge with you, do not hand them over to their master. He knows that. I mean, remember Paul was Saul of Tarsus, a Pharisee. He knew the law very well. So he's stuck here between the law he knows, the law he's living under there in Rome. He's stuck between the crossfire of Onesimus and also Philemon. So he can't keep them, and he can't send them back. Do any of you ever feel like you're caught in the middle of stuff like that sometimes? Family members, coworkers, situations where it's like, what do I, what, what do, I do? I can't keep them. I can't send them back. If I do this, then that's going to happen. But if I do this, then that's going to happen. This is, the, this is the conundrum. This is the dilemma that Paul's in right here. So how does he approach this? And I think this is where we have to understand a need to lean into Scripture. And not just lean into it and read it. If there's something I'd leave you with, this is beyond like leadership talks or things I can give you with. Something I've learned this year. Study the Scriptures. Study them. Study them. Because you might see one word and it says, I, I, was just, I was just preaching here recently out of Acts 17. It says, it says, and they took Paul to Areopagus. The word took in the Greek is not what you think. Like beginning to learn why, why does this mean what it means for my life? Many times I think we're caught and we go, uh, what do I do? How, how do I approach this? How do I go after this? I think many times we, if we were to just stop and realize we have not studied the Bible enough. We have not really spent our time to really just see what God has to say. Why does he say it? Why is that true? Anybody that tries to tell me the Bible has contradictions, simply you've not studied it enough. It is infallible. It is without error. The Old Testament to the New Testament, it never contradicts itself. It has every single thing that we need. So what does he do? He comes down to the truth, one very important truth. I've been saved 
through faith, by grace in Jesus, I'm not under the Levitical law anymore. That's done. Now, Jesus said, I've not come to abolish the law, but to fulfill it. But I'm, it's not a mass. The, the law is not over me anymore. I now get to operate in love, not the law. Okay, so that means now we got rid of the Levitical law in this sense, but he's still under Roman law. So what does this mean? How do I focus on this now when I'm under Roman law? What does Paul recognize about Onesimus? And now this is where we can articulate and lean into Scripture. What does, he, what does Paul tell Philemon? Look at Philemon again in verse 15. He said, perhaps the reason he was separated from you for a little while was that you might have him back forever. Look at, no longer as a slave, but better than a slave as a dear brother. Perhaps the reason that God allowed Onesimus to run away from Philemon, to steal from him, all of that. So he would run into Paul, which means he'd run into Jesus, which means when he encountered Jesus, he'd be a completely changed man. And here's what happens. When we are changed by Jesus, he becomes the one that saves us, which means we call him Savior. But we have to remember a couple things about Jesus. He's not just Savior. If he's the descended from God, sent as the Son of God, that means that if we're the creation of God, sons and daughters of God. That means Jesus is what? Our big brother. So I have three, uh, two brothers, right? Three of us in my family, all boys. Paul says here, better than a slave as a dear brother, okay? So if you're a brother, okay, is anybody, is anybody here a brother in the room? Okay. So if you're a brother given to your parents, what else does that make you then to your parents? If, if, if you are a brother to your sibling, then what are you to your parents? What is it? A son. So we got to lean in a little bit more here then. He says here that better than a slave, a dear brother, but you're not just a brother in that case. John 8, 35 and 36 says, now a slave has no permanent place in the family, but a son belongs to it forever. So if the son, Jesus, sets you free, you'll be free indeed. What did we just solve there now? We just solved this thought that although Paul writes in Romans to follow the laws of the land, which means when I was on the way here running late for rehearsal, I looked down, I was like, okay, back it up. Set the cruise control. Follow the laws of the land. Help me, Lord. Help me. Although he says that, when it now goes against God's word, he clarifies, we always follow truth. So he understands here now that Levitical law is covered by the grace, faith, and love of Jesus. But Roman law only applies to slaves. He's not a slave anymore. He's a son. You understand? See, Paul begins to be, take the truth of what Jesus says, the truth of Old Testament, and he now applies it to Onesimus, which brings us now to the question, if you understand now the history of it. I want to look at verse 10 and 11 and ask you the important question of why we're here. I appeal to you for my son Onesimus. So Paul's saying here, he's like a spiritual son to me, Philemon. He's not a slave anymore. He's a son. Who became my son while I was in chains. Formerly, track it, he was useless to you. But now he has become useful both to you and to me. So the question that we are trying to approach here is are you useless or useful? And how do you know? Are you useful to the Lord? Are you useful to the people in this room as team members? Are you useful to this house? Are you useful to your family? Are you useful at your workplace for God's glory? Are you useless or are you useful? That's the question I want to approach. Because if you're useful, this is what I want you to understand. This is what Pastor Luke was talking about in this first session. You know what that means? It means you're going to be used. And that word has a negative connotation in our world today. To be used. A lot of people are like, oh, that church, they just used me. They just wanted my money and wanted me to serve. And you know, they used me too much. And oh, I got church hurt and I left. In like the world of church culture today, it has a negative connotation. In the world today, it has a negative connotation, right? Right away, if you feel like you're working X amount of hours, you go and you say, listen, I'm working these amount of hours. I should get paid more. You're, I'm getting used and abused. 
seeing the word of God being used is not a negative connotation. In our world, yes. In the word, no. Being used is as good as it gets. Look what Jesus says. Remember when, when Saul of Tarsus is on the road to Damascus to kill more Christians? Jesus shows up in a blinding light. What does he have to say about him? He says this to Ananias to, when he goes there. But the Lord said to Ananias, which is the man that laid his hands on Paul and received his sight after he was blind for three days, go, he's saying, Paul, this man is my chosen instrument to proclaim my name to the Gentiles and their kings and to the people of Israel. I will show him how much he must suffer for my name. What was Jesus saying? I am going to use him. He is going to get used and abused for my glory. He's going to get used and used and used. Here's what I've learned. When we're, when we're uh, serve team members here, when we're building the kingdom of God, when we're week after week giving ourselves, when we're leaning in, when we're, when we're sacrificing, right? We're, we're called to sacrifice with our finances, sacrifice with our time, sacrifice with our gifts and our, and our, our efforts in every way. We're called to stretch. We're called to be flexible. If you're going to be used, then you're going to be bruised. I just need you to know that. If you're going to be used for God's glory, then know you're going to be bruised. I think many times people think that just being used is like, oh, I, I'm willing to use, I, be used. I have this talent. I'd like to use my, my, my talent for this. Great. You should. But also you have to understand that if you're going to sign up to serve in the capacity that God's called you to, you now signed up to go to war. You signed up to hit the battlegrounds and go to war. If you don't want Satan to touch you, if you want your family, your marriage, your life untouched, then stop serving Jesus, first of all. Start there. Because he won't touch you because he already has you and he wants to keep it as easy as possible so you don't feel any conflict. I just married a couple, a, a number, like about, about a month ago. They've been, they, were, they were living together for 12 years and they wanted to get baptized. And I talked to them in the lobby. I said, listen, if you can get baptized, we got to do it the right way. You need to come into a marriage covenant with God. And they said, we've been talking about that. We've been wondering. God's been convicting us. Let's, like, let's get married. Just married them. Talked to them very recently. How's marriage going? Man, it's been the hardest month of our life. Why? Because when you finally step in and do it God's way, if you're going to be used, you're going to be bruised. There's going to be conflict, resistance. There's going to be everything that can come against you. If you're going to be used, you're going to be bruised. Turn to somebody next to you and say, if you're going to be used, you're going to be bruised. Tell them. Remind, remind each other. We smile now, but when the bruises come, we don't later. So the question I'm trying to ask with all of you today that I want to lean into is how do you know whether or not you're useless or useful for the kingdom of God? How do you really know? And I'm going to kind of package it a little bit more in like a leadership package for you, some leadership principles, some things hopefully that will help you. And maybe even at the very least, it's going to check our hearts here. And I'm going to start just right here. You're useful if. That's how we'll start. When you take notes, it's very simple. You're useful if. The first one is you're a humble servant. That's why we're here. We can talk about being leaders all day long, but Jesus actually wasn't asking us to be leaders. He's asking us to be servants, that we would lead through servanthood. I think, I think we're, when we break this down, you're useful if you're a humble servant. It's because the reality I want you to understand is that you can serve and still not be humble. You understand this, right? You can serve and do it for appearances. You can serve and do it for applause. You can serve and do it for the cookie. Bringing it back to session one. You can serve and do it for the pat on the back, but you can serve and not be humble. I want you to understand. It's like, it's very easy to do that. I think many times, some of you need to know though with, with, with your gifts and things like that, strengths that God gives you, sometimes when we think being a servant, we just think that means, oh, I better play in the background, better make sure I'm never seen, better make sure I'm never out in the spotlight. You realize I have to stand in the spotlights every single week to preach, to lead worship, whatever, like that. We just have to light the stage so you guys can see us. Unless you just want us in the dark and that's easier to be led, like however you want to do it. But I think sometimes we think we have to play the background in order to be a servant or play the background in order to be humble. And that is not the truth. You can be out front using your gifts, greeting people at the doors. It can be out front if the Lord leads you in certain speaking abilities. You can be out front in so many capacities, but you still have to be humble. 
And many times I think the measure is somebody either gets the microphone or somebody's finally out front and they then for some reason drop the humility. So you have to lead out front as if you're behind the scenes. You have to lead out front and remember that, yeah, the, the light's on me, but I'm only here to reflect the light back to Jesus. I'm here to put the spotlight on Jesus right now. And some of you have great gifts when it comes to, like, your hospitality, your personability, the way that you're able to connect with people when they come in. Why would we want to put every single person backstage when we could have people greeting and people out in the parking lot and people serving in all these different capacities? We are called to serve out front and behind the scenes in every capacity for God's glory. But the biggest thing we're called to do is serving is setting. I want you to understand. Pastor, when we first were moving into this new building and beginning of the ministry and all these things, he was saying, listen, we're called to set the table and serve people. Serving is setting. Serving is setting the pace. Ser serving is setting the example. You realize, like, the one that we're trying to emulate our life after, you've heard of, like, they call athletes, like, the GOAT, right? Like, the greatest of all time. They're the GOAT. Like, Michael Jordan is the GOAT. Jesus is the GOATS. He is the greatest of all time servant. He's the GOATS. Right? The Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve. And so we're called to emulate that. Did Jesus keep himself always behind the scenes or did he step out and sometimes have to do things that required an aspect of leadership? I don't want us to get confused because serving does not, and being humble does not mean not being seen. It means making sure that God is seen. And stepping out in a humble fashion to say, Lord, I know that I could actually do this and I could put on a show and I could do it for appearances. I could do it just to be seen and get a pat on the back. But you actually cannot bless me if that's my heart. You, and I, I love this. There's an Old Testament scripture where it speaks to these priests. And it says, listen, you can serve and lead my people, but you can't minister and lead me. He says, you can minister to my people, but you can't minister to me. I don't want to just be used to minister to people's hearts. I want to minister to God's heart. I want it to be a sweet-smelling fragrance in his nostrils, the Bible says. Next one, if you're used, and you're useful, I should say, you're useful if you're single-minded. James, the brother of Jesus, who originally did not believe that Jesus was the Messiah, then he died and rose again, and when Jesus ascended, his brother James is like, shoot, he's exactly who he said he was. He actually, you can read about him in Acts 15, he becomes the leader of the church in Jerusalem. How cool is that? Jesus' brother is leading the church. Didn't believe him who he was. Can you imagine growing up with your brother your whole life, and you don't believe that he's going to be the son, he is the son of God and going to be the Messiah? But James later, he goes on to lead to the church in Jerusalem, and what did he teach us? James taught us, if any of you lacks wisdom, you should ask God, and it'll be given to you, James says. But he continues then, I want you to notice this, in verse 6. He continues in verse 6 after he says that, and he says, but when you ask, meaning if any of you lack, you should ask. But when you ask, you must believe and not doubt, because the one who doubts is like a wave of the sea, blown and tossed by the wind. That person should not expect to receive anything from the Lord. Such a person is what? Double-minded and unstable in all they do. We have a principle with our gateway team that we use internally, and it's an echo that we do. We say two hands, and then when I say it, everyone goes, one head, one heart, meaning there's one vision and there's one mind for our church. And I teach this in the capacity to make sure we never have any Jezebel spirits or Absaloms waiting at the gate so that they can't come to their father David trying to crush the kingdom, things like that. And I always say, listen, there's one vision here. It's pastor's vision. And we're going to come around the vision of Jesus that's been given to our pastor, and we're going to follow that vision. There's one head, there's one heart. But you notice there's the possibility for two hands. And the hands can get in there, and they can mess things up. So, yeah, there's two hands, but let's be, let's be just reminded right now. There's one head and one heart. The principle here, if you're used, you're single-minded, that means you're going to have a single vision you come under, which is the vision of this house that our pastor has given us. And I very humbly walk in that to know that God's blessed us with somebody who loves us so much to have vision for people being saved and marriages being restored and families sticking together and something like today with Sir, Serve Summit, all that stuff. Like We come under with a single-minded vision. What happens a lot of times is people become double-minded. And people begin to get just tossed by the wind and what people have to say and all that. It's single vision, single faith of one. 
It says in Acts chapter 2 that all the believers were of one heart and one mind. We want to be a church that's single-minded. If you're, you're useful if, here's the next one. Oh, man, we need to do that, this in this generation. You stay on guard. You know, Luke records, he's, Luke is the writer of the book of Acts, and he records in Acts 20, verse 28. Be on guard, Paul's saying, for yourselves. He's speaking there to the church and for all the flock, among which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers. So he's specifically speaking to, like, leaders. To shepherd the church of God, which is purchased with his own blood. I know that after my departure, savage wolves, are we not seeing this in this generation? Savage wolves will come in among you, not sparing the flock, and from among your own selves, within the church, people will rise up speaking perverse things to draw away the disciples after them. We see this. Therefore, be on the alert, remembering that day and night for a period of three years, I did not cease to admonish each one with tears. Admonish means I warned you. I warned you. What does he say? He's a warning you of two things. Be on guard and be on the alert. I can tell you, you are only useful to God if you stay on guard. You're only useful if you recognize that in, a, in, a, in an instant. I think some people that think, oh, no, I'll, I'll never turn from the church. I'll never fall away. I could, come on. Any one of us on our worst day could, absolutely. Which is why we need the conviction of the Holy Spirit which is why we need the word of God, which is why we need to follow this. What does he say? He starts by saying, be on guard, and he ends by saying, and be on the alert. Be on guard for this house. Be on guard for your own heart. Be on guard for your family. Be on guard and be alert. Be watchful. Always. Always. You know, the, 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 the Bible shows us even, it refers to it as watchmen that would, would look over. We have that here. We have watchmen over this house. How much more do we need to be watchmen over our own hearts? Watchmen then over the flock. When, when we see, I, I think sometimes are we waiting for pastors to have to confront every single person that we know is in sin when y'all already know people are in sin and you could go to them and say, hey, as a brother or sister in the faith, I just want to tell you, I see this in you and I'm concerned. Why are we leaving all the dirty job to us? Can't we be liked every once in a while? But what would it look like if servant leaders were on guard and alert. They were saying, listen, we ain't letting any savage wolves come in here and get any of this flock. We care too much for one another, and we care too much to see the body of Christ continue to be unified. You're useful if you truly, catch this word, truly love people. Not say you love people, if you truly love people. Look at how Paul talks to Philemon about Onesimus. Look how he speaks of him in verse 12. I am sending him who is my very heart back to you. Look at verse 17, 18. So if you consider me a partner, welcome him as you would welcome me. If he has done you any wrong or owes you anything, what does he say? Charge it to me. I love him so deeply. He's my very heart. I'll take care of his needs. Charge it to me. Do we go to bat for people like this? Do we truly believe in people like this? Let's ask our hearts. Let's ask ourselves here. Do we pray for God's people like this? In verse 4, Paul literally says, I always thank my God as I remember you in my prayers. He's like, I'm thinking of you all the time. Do we pray for God's church like this? Do we pray for one another like this? Do we love people like this? Like, why are you serving? Are you serving to fulfill a position? Or are you serving because you love people? Because the position matters very little if you don't love the people you're serving. Me up here preaching, me up here teaching, me up here leading in any capacity, if I don't actually love the people I'm leading, it means nothing. I could conjure up every single creative way to express the Bible and bring it to people, but if I actually don't love them, it doesn't mean anything. Because they walk away with fleeting words, not the heart of God. Do you truly love people? Is that why we serve? Do we serve from a place that we love people deeply? Do you know why that matters? Because people will hurt you. If you're going to be used, then you're going to be bruised. It matters that we love people because people will deceive you. People will turn their back on you. People will leave this church. People will decide to go their own way. People will backbite and gossip and speak against you. 
But God still called us to love them. Why? Because people are the heart of God. He loves his people. Loves them so much he gave his one only son, knowing that they would turn on him and sin against him. Do we truly love people? Let me end with this. Loving people is obviously very important, but that's not where it starts. If you're useful, then you're going to truly love Jesus. You're useful if you truly love Jesus. Now, again, I could have just said love Jesus. Yeah, that's simple. You'd be like, oh, I love Jesus. No, no, like, listen to the word I use. I said, if you truly love Jesus, like you truly, in your heart of hearts, you love him. I was convicted even this morning as Pastor Luke was speaking in that session. I was convicted. I'm like, Lord, increase my love for you. Like, increase my love for you. Teach me how to love you more, Jesus. Like, put a depth in me of love for you. Help me to love you deeper. Do you truly love him above all else? Do you desire to spend time with him? Not like, oh, i got to do my devos for today. No, like, do you desire to spend time with him? Does his voice matter to you? Even this, when you hear his voice, are you going to follow what he says? Many people consider his instructions as comments. They're not comments, they're commands. But do you love him so much that you don't see it that way? When he convicts you, you don't see it as a bad thing. You realize he convicts you because he loves you. He commands you because he loves you. He literally says, if you're telling me you love me, those that love me, they'll obey me. They'll obey my commands, he says. Do you love him? Is your faith in him above all else? Do you love his word? Like as I talk about this, are you like, well, it's okay. I had to sign up for like a breakout and I guess I'll just listen. Or it's like, oh, that's so sweet. Philemon, Onesimus, 932 mile journey to Rome. That's great. Like it's not about, it's not like, oh, I'm a history buff. I like it. Or, oh, that was a cool couple facts. No, it's like, it's like this. It was a living, breathing time in history that was written about and is literally changing us today still because they recorded it. Because Paul wrote this letter, rather than, oh, woe is me, I'm in chains right now. Could I get a cookie, please? Rather than that, he's like, you know, I'm going to take my hand, and with this pen, I'm going to inscribe something that he just thought at that time is going to impact Philemon. But the Holy Spirit knew it was going to impact 2023, the church of Jesus Christ. Do we love his word? Are we open to a move of his Holy Spirit? He says, go, you go. He says, stop, you stop. I had a situation last night, like I said, encountering a demon. He says, speak, you speak. I'm like, come on. But when the Holy Spirit begins to nudge you, convict you, stir you, you almost get like a sick knot in your gut. If I don't do this, I'm disobedient. And disobedience is sin. It's very simple. If he tells you to do something, you don't do it, it's sin. Do we love him so much, though, that we don't see it from the angle of like, well, I shouldn't sin. I don't see it that way. I see it as I want to love Jesus, not I just shouldn't sin. I want to see it as I want to fall more in love with Jesus. And I think the reason I brought this for you today is because I feel like so many of you, God has such a hand in your life. It's not that you're just gifted or talented, things like that. I know you have a deep heart for God, but many of you don't see yourselves the way that God sees you. And many of you feel useless. You don't feel useful in many ways, you look at yourself either as you're getting older or because it's what's funny is when we're when we're younger, we feel like we're too young to be used. When we get older, we feel like we're too old to be used. Is there ever a good point? Is there ever like the perfect point? I felt that so many times. I'm like, is there gonna be a point which people won't just look at me as like, well, he's just a young man. He doesn't know. And then and then what is it? Okay, I got some more grays. Do I know him? No, he's. He's still, he's still more fit and skinny, and he still can eat whatever he wants, and uh, he can still jump around. He's got good knees. Uh, okay, is it when I have kids? Oh, he has toddlers. Maybe when he has teenagers, I'll listen to him. Maybe when he's married, not nine years. When it's, is there a point in which we ever want to listen? Because my papa is 93 years old, has the most wisdom you could give, but nobody actually wants to sit down and hear a 93-year-old. Let's be honest. I'm talking, about, I'm talking about a lot of people that don't actually care to hear the wisdom. All the wisdom in the world, not all, but a lot. So is there a point in which we actually are there in the prime? I don't, I don't think so. I think that the devil tries to in every way continue to tell us and, and feed this lie that we're useless. So I just prescribed to you a couple different simple steps here. You're useful if... The Bible shows us very simply, we are useful to God if we love Jesus with all our heart, if we love people with all of our heart. We are useful if 
And it really does become that simple. And I think I was doing this this morning. I think like for some of you, it is this simple. Maybe just stop and we'll do it here as we close in a minute and say, Jesus, you can use me. However you want, you can use me. I understand that if I'm used, I'm going to be bruised. I understand that if I love people, they're going to hurt me. I understand that if I love you, you're going to convict me and command me and challenge me. And ooh, I know that. I understand that if I'm a serve, I have to be humble. Like you can go through it, but like it's today just saying, Jesus, would you use me? I want to show you here what happens when you pivot from useless to useful. You're know, the slave Onesimus, remember? He delivers this letter back to Paul. And church history records that Onesimus, he receives freedom and he like literally now on earth is no longer a slave, no longer a servant. He receives his freedom. And you know what he becomes? A bishop of the church. You know, we call that a pastor of the church of Jesus Christ. Some early writers say that he led the church at Colossae, others say at Ephesus, but he becomes a pastor. Either way, he goes from slave to son. He goes from useless to useful. Do you know what the name Onesimus means? You know what it translates to? Useful. That's its actual translation. But Paul said, although your name means useful, at one point you were useless. But now look what Jesus has done. You're living up to your name. You're not only useful to me, you're useful to the Lord. You're useful to the body of Christ. Do not let the devil feed you this lie that you are useless. If you can go down this checklist, look at the word of God, I'm useful if, and if you can hit that, you're like, man, I'm loving God's church. I'm loving him. I, I'm loving people. I'm serving in this way. And that's where motive matters. We check our hearts. But if you can do that and you can say, Lord, use me, do not let the devil feed you the lie ever that you're too young, you're too old, your body's not strong enough, you don't have enough talents. Those are not the definition of usefulness. God has a different definition. You are useful if. Can I pray over you? Let's just pray a really simple prayer. Somebody here say, Jesus, if you can use me, then use me. I'm not useless. I'm going to be useful for your glory. If you can do it with Onesimus, you can do it with me. Use me, Jesus. Say, I know I'm going to be bruised if I'm used, but I'd rather be used and be useful to you than be useless and just sit the bench. Use me for your glory. In Jesus' name, amen.